I have a surprise for you, and that is that I actually own the facsimile of all the Chopin preludes. Can you imagine opening with his own writing? It's awe-inspiring. So here is the prelude. He writes very clearly so that you can actually read it right from the manuscript. Now, the f prelude right before this one ends with two G major chords. So, I'm, if I were going to play all of the preludes without pause, I would be at the end of this prelude that comes before the E minor one, I would roll the G major chord that ends with a B on the soprano, and I would hold the B right into the E minor prelude. So I'm going to start with the last chords of the G major prelude and fuse it right into the E minor one. If we look at the manuscript at the beginning, we see a piano, and we go 12 bars, and there isn't a single dynamic. Then we continue on another four bars, not a single dynamic. And now we look at the end of the piece, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars from the end. There's a piano and practically nothing except one word uh, to the end of the piece. When this happens in music, and it happens quite frequently, we're on our own. So I want to make it very clear that during these places where there isn't any information by the composer, I will specify that what I'm suggesting is my own idea. And 
all of you have to find your own ideas of interpretation. What does one do at the beginning of this piece? We have two notes coming over and over again. Shall I do? Or shall I do? So I'm going to show you how I feel about that. So we're going to start our lesson by trying to interpret the first 12 bars. Now, I can't help but not feel that this C and B are two note slurs representing size. And, you know, Chopin knew that he was dying. He was almost always in agony. And I have a feeling this is something of the crying in these two notes. Now, the important thing about musical expression is to make a physical connection to your musical feeling. So now the question is, how do we play a two-note slur? The first thing that ever we play in any piece for the rest of your life has to have a preliminary swing stroke. So let's say I'm six years old and I'm going to learn this little musette of Bach. Now, this is what a six-year-old will have to be taught. Place your finger on the key. Don't depress the key. Just on the surface and in a normal hand position. And now this is what you do. You're going to make a swing stroke and play the first note. So now, all students all over the world promise that the first note of anything you play is always going to have a swing stroke. So if you're an advanced pianist and you're going to play the pathetique sonata, you place your hands over C minor and swing. So, so you know, it's a biological rule actually. Anything that's set into motion has to have a preparatory swing stroke. So you know very well, you're going to throw a ball forward. The first thing you do is swing back and throw the ball, right? So here I'm going to play the first note. Okay, so now we're back to two note slurs. I'm going to swing from my upper arm you see, the wrist doesn't undulate like this between the elbow and the fingers. The wrist undulates because my upper arm rolls forward and back again, see? So I'm going to make the swing stroke like this. And now here is a great secret that should hold you in good stead for the rest of your piano study. The very next note is a result of a movement. So never play a two note slur like this. And now play. Never do that. There's always a movement before the note and I'm gonna roll up and to the left. And see that deflects energy and the note is softer. So this is how I interpret the beginning of this prelude.
All right. Now, you see, we're dealing with one of the greatest instruments in the world, but it has a major fault. Unfortunately, every note on the piano dies. So if I depress this key, it's going to die. Can I make that note louder? I can do, I can coerce, it's never going to change. Once the hammer is propelled to the string, it bounces back and our responsibility ends. So now, if we know that, we have to accept the fact that all piano playing is a series of illusions. Now, here's a B. Suppose I want this B to make a crescendo to the C. Well, I can do it with the accompanying figure and move my body a little forward and you will swear that the B made a crescendo. And I'll demonstrate that. See, can you imagine? It, it sounds like the B has made a swell to the C. Now, when we examine this piece, we see that Chopin is a master of chromatic harmony. Let's just take the bass note alone in the left hand. And so forth. And look at the right hand. It sounds to me in a general sense as though Chopin is moaning. As I said, he really knew he was dying. And I think this piece is filled with grief. So uh, the, the chords in the left hand have to be repeated, of course. But if I lift the keys to the top, the chords are going to sound percussive. So you see, I can take a key and lift it almost to the top. And I get rid of that little knocking sound. So we have to control that. Because you have to have a perfectly regulated action in order to do anything like that. So now the balance between the hands, this hand going right to the key bed, to the bottom of the key, and the left hand hovering halfway down. Now I'm going to make a crescendo to this and fade for the first phrase. I'm creating a phrase out of that second phrase. And it's going to come to an end. So that whole first introduction was my own idea, but now there are marks in music that are, I would say they're written in stone. We can't, it's not our interpretation at all. The composer is giving us clear orders. One of them is the 
time signature. There is a C with a slash through it. And that indicates a something called a la breve. Now, in order, you have to understand what the word breve means. Breve is the Italian for the, in, for the notation of a half note. So in this case, Chopin is asking us, don't accent every quarter note. One, two, three, four, but go for the half note. One, two, one, two. See, it doesn't go faster, but it creates a feeling of movement so that the sound will be horizontal and not vertical. Now, I'm not going to mention names, but a very distinguished musician is heard on YouTube sitting at the piano playing the Moonlight Sonata first movement and saying, everyone plays the Moonlight Sonata at the wrong tempo. It's marked a la breve. And he starts playing faster. Well, I like to think that I'm a student forever, even though I'm 92. Like Schumann said, there's no end to learning. So I said to myself, really? A la breve means faster? Nobody ever taught me that. So I combed the internet and I did a lot of research and I never came up with any statement that said a la breve means to play faster. It means only what I told you, that you have a feeling of half notes instead of quarter notes. So in the Moonlight Sonata, we have alla breve adagio, just like this prelude is largo, they're both very slow. And so here is the Moonlight Sonata. I'm going to play it alla breve. One, two, one, two, one, two, one. So it's the same feeling of two in the bar as we have in our prelude. One, two, only two is getting a little crescendo. Clear? All right, so now, the other indication that's written in stone has to do with hairpins. These are the double hairpins. And as we know, we have single ones that do this and single ones that do this. And now, before the Romantic period, the hairpin meant specifically crescendo and diminuendo. But what is very rarely known among today's musicians, as of the Romantic period, the hairpins took on a different meaning. And so it was very difficult for me to find documentation to prove this, but I did a lot of research. It just it took 10 years and one book called Cobbett's Cyclopedic Survey of Chamber Music. I just happened to own this book and I turned to uh, Brahms, as a matter of fact, to look up something and I found a statement by a pupil of Clara Schumann who was at a rehearsal of Brahms uh, rehearsing his trio. And she quoted what Brahms said 
about these double hairpins. This. And this is what she said. When Brahms came to the double hairpins, he played with extra warmth and affection. And here it comes. Not only with tone, but with rhythm also. Now, this is Brahms. So now, in his, in his writing, he sometimes actually tells us that when the hairpin opens, right here, that has nothing to do with dynamics. Actually, this means rubato. So whatever we do here is our own choice. But in the A major intermezzo of Brahms, he has the following passage. So listen what I'm doing. E, F sharp. The hairpin is opening like this over those three notes. And I'm playing the F sharp, the softest, even though the hairpin is at its fullest peak there. He listened to the F sharp. And every pianist I know, especially on YouTube, and even some of the pianists on tone bass who don't know about hairpins, they make a crescendo to the F sharp. And they play like this. But they think it's correct because they think the hairpin means dynamics. So this is very important information, what I'm about to read to you. And it's by none other than Fanny Mendelssohn, the sister of Felix Mendelssohn. See, she writes this. And in the first sentence, she actually records the the double hairpin, and she says the following. The hairpin, of course, sign stands for a cellerando and retardando. Wow. Is that explosive information? I found this quote 10 years after I did my research, and suddenly it appeared. The instruction is striking on several counts. First, the performer is to interpret the tempo flexibly, see, with rubato, presumably in a type of rubato. The rhythmic groupings are not literal, but elastic, now pressing forward, now restrained traditionally used to control dynamics, here it comes, the hairpins regulate instead a constantly shifting sense of rhythmic energy and abatement. Well, what further proof do we need? Well, that doesn't seem to be enough proof for my colleagues. They argue with me all the time. That's not possible, they say. Really? So I did some research among the Chopin compositions, and I found irrefutable evidence that the hairpin can't mean dynamic. So here is the first proof. So on this C, she's 
Chopin has the following, the word diminuendo and a hairpin closing like this. Now, I looked at that for some 40 years. I never paid any attention except, that, oh, he's telling us twice that it means diminuendo. Chopin is never redundant. He will give us some information, but never twice. So because the word diminuendo is there, the hairpin that's closing can't mean diminuendo. What does it mean? Where it's opened, it means to linger. See, these are, di these are now er er rhythmic fluctuations, not dynamics. Where to linger and then go ahead, as I did. So there is some very important information um, uh, from Brahms about rubatos. And I think it's very important that I recite what he said. So Clara Schumann's pupil wrote all of this down during that rehearsal. And this is what Brahms said about rubatos, and it holds for musicians of all calibers, especially virtuoso musicians who may not know about this. This is what how Brahms, what Clara Schumann's pupil said about Brahms's rubatos. He would linger on a note or a group of notes as though he couldn't tear himself away from their beauty. And then he would never be so foolish as to make up the bar into a metronomic bar. Well, before I read this, I have always told my pupils when they came to a rubato, rob Peter, but don't pay Paul. <laughs> so you see when musicians rob the tempo by by holding back, they feel guilty about it, and then they go faster. So Brahm said, no, no, you just go back to the tempo. So you see in a place like this, linger, go back to the tempo. And I hear pianists doing this. If they do, if they take a retard, they make it up. So look here, I have more irrefutable proof. This is from this prelude that I just played for you. There's a hairpin opening and closing. And at the end of the closing, there is the word diminuendo. And wouldn't you know that every pianist that I've heard makes a diminuendo where that hairpin is and they don't wait until Chopin wrote that word diminuendo. All right, so here is a forte, and the next bar says diminuendo. Where does that forte end? It goes right through to the word diminuendo. Students of music, students, all students of music, not just the piano. The word crescendo, where the word appears, means piano. Don't be surprised, because if you don't play piano, there won't be any crescendo. So really skilled musicians, when they see the word crescendo, they turn into a little pussycat. 
The famous conductor George Zell had his own feelings about these words, and one day he stopped a rehearsal and told his men and women of the orchestra, ladies and gentlemen, every time you see a long crescendo, start it three-fifths of the way after you see the word. Well, they thought that he had lost it. Of course, he didn't lose it. He was simply speaking the truth. So here is some very important information for all musicians. When you see words written in stone, such as crescendo, diminuendo, accelerando, retardando, etc., smorzando, Pretend that you don't do anything where that word is. All of those words are anticipatory. They're giving you full warning what you're about to do, but you never try to do it immediately where you see the word, unless the composer says subito, which means suddenly. Now, getting back to this prelude, <clears throat> we already discussed a Chopin's predilection for chromatic harmonies. Now, when these chords change, now the G goes a half step down, and now the, the alto goes a half step down. You see, in general, this piece is written in four-part harmony. Here is the soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And you know Chopin was very influenced by Bach. Did you know that he knew all the preludes and fugues from memory? And here's some other very interesting information that I read in a book that was mostly written by his pupils about their lessons. When Chopin prepared for his recitals of his own music, what do you think he practiced? He didn't even practice his own music. He just performed it. But he spent all of his time practicing preludes and fugues. He thought he gains everything from this information. So naturally his writing is influenced by the contrapuntal techniques that he learned from Bach. So now here we go. The alto is going to shift. Now there's such a thing in playing the piano called voicing, where one note of a chord is projected over the other notes. And it's very difficult to do. And it really tells you the artist from the keyboardist. Real artists know how to voice. So I'm going to teach you how to voice one chord. Let's just take a C major chord. So here's bass, tenor, alto, soprano. All right. So now here is my instruction. You are to play the piano, the soprano, forte, and never take your foot off the right pedal. Over and over again. See how I'm rolling into the key with my upper arm? I'm not doing this. I'm not hitting the key and I'm not doing this. An upstroke is also part of our choreography. But in this instance, we're going to go down into the key. And now the thumb is going to lie only on the surface of E without depressing it. Mm -hmm. 
And now I'm going slightly to depress the E. Until I hear it. Oh, there it is. Now, why is the E softer? You see, when the action of the piano is regulated properly, there is a little resistance right here, almost halfway down, and you pierce the resistance, and the hammer travels on its own. So if I can stop the key, see? See how softly I can play? And here's going down to the key bed. So look what I did. Key bed, escapement level. And I'm doing it with one hand. And now I'm touching the tenor. And I'm going to lower it until I hear it. And now I'm doing the bass. I have the radiance of a string quartet with my own two hands. And we have to do the same thing here. I'm going to accentuate sometimes the thumb. In other words, wherever the moving voice is, I'm going to accentuate that note. Bass. Alto. Bass. Alto. Tenor. So I tried to do that while I was playing. But it, since it's subdued altogether, you probably would not have recognized it. But that's part of the musical expression of this piece. Now, I think I have to say a, a word about playing loud on the piano. I find it very startling. Sometimes very marvelous pianists come to me and I ask them, how do you play loud and soft on the piano? And they can't tell me. I mean, they say, oh, I use more energy to play loud and less energy to play soft. But I say to them, but what do you do to the piano that makes a note louder or softer? And the answer is, when you depress this key quickly, that hammer is propelled to the string fast, and it's going to be loud. And if you depress the key slowly, the hammer is propelled more slowly, and the, the sound is softer. If you don't understand that, you can feel music all you want, but the piano won't recognize it. So we have to understand how to transmit our feelings to the keyboard. And we have to know something about the keyboard in order to do that. There comes a terrific problem among pianists when they play uh, full-fledged crescendos. And that is that they make the fatal error of making the crescendo with the accompanying figures. And therefore, the melody is forced to be heard. And so, and then the, the crescendo just sounds raucous instead of fulfilled. I'm going to do it incorrectly right now so that you hear what happens if I make the crescendo in this piece with both hands.
Mm -hmm. See, that's what you call banging, right? So now I'm going to subdue the left hand and give it all to the single notes of the right hand. Bass moves, bass and alto. Now look at that chord that I just played. It's like a profound shuddering, kind of a horror feeling. I'm speaking about this chord. Now mind you, this is an E minor prelude and he introduces a B flat he actually is creating a C7 chord right at that moment. But now look here, this was pointed out by a fabulous Korean pianist who was my pupil for many years, Esther Park. She pointed out to me that here, look, here's an E minor chord. Yes. And if you take the B, and you go a half step above it and a half step below it, B flat and C, and you move it down two octaves into the darkness of this register, you have that chord. I'm sure Chopin knew that when he made this chromatic transition into that chord. So with all that I try to suggest to students, you get a feeling of a piece, one of the most profound ones that Chopin ever wrote. It's a beloved piece. In fact, it's so beloved that it was performed at Chopin's funeral. And everything in the piece, the chromatic harmonies and the two note phrases, crying, it's a piece that projects deep emotion of the most uh, intense kind of a man who is really dying in his thirties and it's, it's rewarding for us to go into that area of emotional understanding. Because you see, in the final analysis, musicians are very fortunate people because in order to interpret music properly, we have to know three major things. We have to know emotionally what the composer is trying to convey. We can't just play with our feelings, so we have to understand intellectually everything on the printed page. And then the third thing is that's not sufficient. We have to make a physical connection to everything that we feel and think. And what that means is that we're working on our person, not just our talent. And that's what you take away from your practice sessions so that everything that you learn 
through the discipline of music, you project into everything you do in life.